I was going to ask a question about why not spend some time tonight on topics totally unconnected to the subject of connections, <laughs> or speak about new and varied things. No, not speak about new and varied things having to do with the area of variety. So, having narrowed it down <laughs> to that kind of expanse, does anybody notice the difficult, the pleasures to pay it renewed respect, give it some fresh homage of how difficult it is to talk about such things specifically as talking about things? And several things had come up. I had some questions from several people and some things that we had hit in passing that I believe is sufficiently unrelated, unconnected to this, to use. And one had to do with the fact, I believe it was Kairut who said it, having to do with the fact that men ordinarily speak in qualifiers. Or he had some little picture about the intellectual path of man strewn with the landmines of qualifiers or some such literary flamboyance. But there is a fact having to do with qualifiers and the lack of plain speak. As much as we've talked about and hinted about and ran around almost in three-dimensional circles so that it gives the snake a chance to look itself in the anti-snake, <laughs> having to do with what might be some benefits under certain conditions, how those were qualifiers, of not talking so much, or having to do with certain possibilities under certain conditions of humidity and latitude for additional qualifiers, of maybe not talking at all, which leaves you with wondering what could be said about someone who would not talk. Somewhere in the midst of all that was what I would be referring to as plain speak <coughs> and how in the ordinary mill of life, the ordinary world, the ordinary world of in secondary intelligence, whatever plain speak might be able to be defined as would be almost <coughs> verboten. It would be in direct conflict with a world of connections. Ordinary secondary intelligence in anybody is not wired up, it is not primed to deal with whatever we may be inferring presently with plain speak. And perhaps to get some of you started, since everyone seems to still be looking like the headlights in late afternoon of a 57 Edsel, <laughs> let me point out, let me start another way. Life, life has laid out, hence, and stories in different ways as always does to do with this and there's one that uh, continues to resurface in the western world especially through Christianity through Judaism in a slightly different form but it keeps popping up was the Old Testament I think it was at any rate the admonishment that one should not swear not use profanity, but that one should not, when testifying, when stating something there in the village, that one should not take an oath. One should not say, you know, I swear on my father's head, or I swear to Jehovah that I'll tell the truth in this hearing. And I have, in passing, heard all sorts of strange things made out of that. But what was the purpose of that? That I not going to try and quote it, but there are the versions in other parts of the world and other parts of time. But what it says is something like this, is that if you're going to testify, I think it's the way it came out in the Western religions, that if you're actually going to testify, like at some hearing or some trial, that you refuse, that you do not need to take an oath, that you just simply say, I'll tell the truth. You don't have to say, I'll tell the truth by God, or I'll tell the truth on my mother's gravestone. Well, let's stretch it right quick in case even this is not all that 
and lightning. That coupled with the historic worldwide concern over the difficulties of telling the truth to begin with. May I ask you to consider what in the hell is up? What would it be? What could be the real basis, since all of you are good enough, we'll assume that you're not concerned with imaginary anthropomorphic gods and for some reason the god there in the Middle East and now living, I assume, somewhere in the North American continent, why he cares whether if you're going to say something and someone says, we need your word, we need your testimony, will you tell the truth? Yes, I will. Will you swear to tell the truth? Why would he care whether you're going to swear to tell the truth? So you've got to get to the basis of energy. And I ask you, what does the words represent that could be a reflection of certain flows of energy? And it has to do with flows of energy that I am trying to infer, instead of it being plain speak, which would be simply going from here to there, that you plug it in, the outlet, and the light. Let's say we've got a six-foot cord there on the lamp, and you plug it in, and it comes on. Qualifiers, you might say, to use that picturization, God knows where we're going with it, you plug in the lamp and with the qualifiers, instead of that six-foot cord, perhaps you turn on someone's toaster in Indianapolis, and then perhaps it runs part of an atomic plant in Afghanistan, and then, perhaps, it lights up your little lamp. But plain speak, a direct flow of energy seems to be encouraged by life, such as if you're going to speak, if you're going to testify in some way, if you're going to give evidence, simply tell the truth. But do not take an oath. Who cares? What does it mean? I suggest to you, if we're going to play suggest to you time, that life is still trying to leak out the information in advance, as always. It's pondering off on its own over in nooks and crannies, sometimes known as people and grannies, that wouldn't it be something if energy could flow directly from the socket into the lamp? That if people could plainly speak, if people could say, all right, the evidence I'm going to give, did you see so-and-so happen? Yes. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, as they would say in the city. That, that's, that's not quite going to do. Let's back up a second. I assume you're telling the truth. And you didn't see it. You didn't see him do it, no. Will you swear to that? Are you actually telling the truth? Yes. And you didn't see him, no. Yeah, but will you take an oath? Will you absolutely swear? If we go bring in a holy book or if we bring in your mother's head, will you, act, will, like, will you put your hand on it or the word testimony, according to some scholars tracing it back to Latin, I don't think I'd get into, but it had to do with men, like case any of you would like to consider where the word testimony, what it might have in a root word, is that men used to have to hold a certain part of their body, supposedly, and say, I testify, and it was to some red circuit people, that part of their body that starts with a T, it's not their tetrachloride, was supposedly, I guess, even more sacred and dear to them than their mother's head or their religion, which I, for one, am not going to say the men were wrong. <laughs> but at any rate, they say, will you, will you swear, will you take an oath that you're telling the truth? I, if we were talking about a direct flow of energy, plain speak, none of this would happen, I suggest to you, would it? That just tell the truth. Say whatever you're going to say, and that's it. To perhaps stretch a little I was hoping to consider all the way as far back as you have recorded history right up until the day of people you can stand in the post office as if you had a choice <laughs> and you can hear people talking to their little children it goes on continually about the difficulty philosophically and in reality in the practice of child rearing the relationship between lovers and family the difficulty that everyone agrees of telling the truth 
of getting other people to tell the truth. This is so much a part of the energy flow that I know without even asking, I won't even make it rhetorical, that no one, not even you at the ordinary level, gives out any thought. But now give it some thought. What the hell's a big deal? Why do you need analysis? Why do you need a book on philosophy? Why do you need to sit down and study? Why do you have to deal with your child or with your lover to say, are you telling me the truth about where you were last night? And you try to remember something you read a book about body language and she says, uh, yes, my mother was in sound. <laughs> and there's this whole great complex that runs throughout the history of man, the nervous system, about the difficulties of either telling the truth on your own, like, well, there's something if you're caught, perhaps. Or someone says, wait a minute, what you just said is not true. And you think, well, all right, but wait a minute. I saw a guy in a store today that reminded me of my father. You remember the one I was telling you about that Ronf and left me? And I don't know every time it happens, something happens to my lips and my tongue. I, they want to tell. And we all, whether you accept that one particular story or not, it's just an accepted fact that it's part of the nexus of the human nervous system that there is extreme, quite real difficulty, something to be still worked out after these thousands of years we're all still working on it, to tell the truth. I ask you, what is the goddamn big deal? I mean, if they say, well, all right, what we want, or somebody talking to a child, I hope you're not missing this because it's so simple. Like you're talking to a child, you're raising a child, and you say, did you throw the pie on the floor? Did you knock it off the table? And the kid goes, no. And, of course, you, you're sure he did. You're just, you don't even think about it. You walked out of the room, he was in there, you came back and the pie's on the floor. And you still had to. And so there you are being a reasonable, sophisticated adult with probably a high school education, and you go, well, how'd it get on the floor? And the kid, of course, being a lot dumber than you are, says, uh, uh, a swarthy looking guy with a long beard came in and knocked it off while I, while I was laying over there. And you go, oh, come on, that's not true. And so you, you decide, having read a book one time on child rearing, or maybe it was animal husbandry, but uh, you, can't. you say, now, wait a minute, you're going to have to learn. Now, that was my favorite pie, I just cooked it, and your father's going to be mad if he ever comes back again. <laughs> but uh, as mad as I am, as mad as I am, I'm, I'm even madder that you would lie to me. You're going to have to learn now to tell the truth. Everybody just accepts this is a big deal. Like it's something you got to work with your child. You got to work with you. And like you try to work with a kid, like you got to tell the truth. If you don't tell the truth, I'm going to whip you two times instead of one for knocking it off. Then, let's say it was a woman doing that, just for And then her husband comes home and he says, I thought we were going to have a pie tonight. And so then she says something like, uh, uh, well, your mother called and I was on the phone so long. I didn't, I didn't get to cook it. And then maybe later he's, he just accidentally finds out that his mother is in the hospital. He said, why did you tell me my mother called? And so then there's the person trying to teach a kid about lying. Now she's caught in a lie. In other words, it seems to be this big deal, and nobody ever thinks about it. I ask you again, look at it. What is the damn big deal? What's going on? What people call the truth? Now, I'm not analyzing this. I'm not giving you any kind of strange, unusual definition. Everybody on this planet, if you said, you, you know what the truth is, not philosophically, but you know if you tell somebody uh, that you ran their car, that you backed into it in a parking lot, and somebody suddenly runs out and says, are you the one that backed into my car? The truth is, if you did it, the truth is to say yes. The whole world agrees to that. And then you say, well, you know, is that the way things operate? And an ordinary, just an ordinary person will say, well, no, it's not. A lot of people, if you didn't see them do it, they'll deny it. And what if I say, well, what if you, would you always tell the truth? Well, you know, you caught me on an honest day. Uh, you know, if I say, have you always told the truth? That's what you call it. Every time you backed into somebody's car, if they didn't see and somebody suddenly hollered, who backed into my car? Was it you? And you've already had two or three accidents and your insurance is about to, you, would you say, yes, I did it? Yeah. And this person, this ordinary person, Mr. Everyman, not USA, Mr. Everyman, planet Earth, would go, well, probably not. So everyone would accept, not philosophically, not asking what is the truth, like God is a bagel or something. Just telling the truth, if you ask somebody what is telling the truth, everybody says, well, that's to admit what you know to be so. Now I ask you, how did this get to be such of a big deal? And don't just say, well, people are trying to cover their own ass. About what? I mean, what is it that a kid's going to say, uh, 
No, nah, this guy with a beard came in from nowhere and knocked the pile. Or some little old woman says, who backs into my car? And there you stand like you're a kid again. And your mother says, who knocked out the pie? Why is it you can't say, yeah, I did it? Why well, you got to go, oh, no. I think, it was a, I think it was a guy with a beard, as a matter of fact. <laughs> he had a towel over his hands, and he just drove off. He's going, forget all this of trying to protect yourself. I'm strongly suggesting, well, I've already told you, there's something else afoot. But the ordinary intellect cannot even perceive that. Trying to tell the truth is a horrendously big, big deal in life. <laughs> What is the big deal? Why is it thought to be a big deal? To tell the truth, I'm still using their terms. Nothing strange, nothing philosophical, nothing metaphysical. It's what I'm also suggesting is in that direction from the religious corners, plain speech is simply say yes or no. If you're asked to testify, say yes or no. Don't go swearing, yes, I will. I'm suggesting strongly to you that life lets out this information for its own purposes, like it's noodling around thinking, what would it be in this particular area if I could plug in the lamp and it just lit? That if I would think something, if I asked myself, who knocked the pile, if I'd say I did? Or if I just said, did you do it? I'm sure. Wouldn't that be weird? Now, it obviously would be, as life said, weird. I'm just quoting life. If it would be that weird, it would, without any doubt, be in some way in conflict with the present arrangement of things. Present arrangement of things, from one view, is what we were talking about of how things are connected. Plain speak, a direct flow of energy, as ordinary people would have it, telling the truth would be in direct conflict with a world of connections. It would be a creature of unspecified dimensions, intentions, and appetite turn loose in the secondary world and it might eat up everybody it would certainly eat up everyone's connections it would tear up everyone's tinker toy <coughs> internal open-ended intellect it would be cauterized to death it would be hugged into submission it would be et That's North Carolina philosophical talk. It would be a creature turned loose that would not be beneficial to the secondary world of man here. It would be anathema to a continuing growth of the secondary world. And yet it keeps seeping out not just in religion, but of people saying, we have got to tell the truth. Our children have got to be more truthful. I wish I had enough money to finish analysis. I was just getting to that point. Because I so won't tell the truth. I mean, if I'm staying in a bar and a woman comes up and says, uh, hi, good looking, you want to go home with me? And sometimes I'll say yes, sometimes I'll say no, and it's always ambiguous, even if I don't know what that word actually means. But I always feel somewhat ambivalent, and I won't tell people. Or she'll say, I bet you're a Gemini. And sometimes I'll say, yeah, when I'm not. And I just, why do I do that? Why can't I just tell the truth? Why can't I say, no, nah, I'm a Leo, plus I don't believe in that crap? <laughs> why can't I? And it seems to be something extremely, extremely deep, extremely dicey, tricky. What should we say? with a myriad of possible connections. God knows what causes me. Sometimes I can tell the truth. I mean, if it's just like a guy, if he's more or less my size and my age, if I backed into his car in the parking lot and he didn't see me and suddenly he showed up and he said, who backed in my car? Usually in those circumstances, I can say I did. But I don't, there's something about if it's a real, if it's a real big woman, and she's somewhere in her 60s, and she has her hair especially, maybe tied in a bun with glasses. And I were to hit her car, and she said, who backed into my car? For some reason, it's like, I don't know, I'm not sure. Maybe I could speculate, but at any rate, I'm not sure. It's like, I can't, I'll say, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I just got here. <laughs> the inference, if you don't go that far to say it, is, God, there's so many possible connections to life 
that it's hard to say. It's, not only is it hard to tell the truth, it's hard to say even why it's hard to tell the truth. I mean, why do I lie? Why am I inclined to lie to a heavy set older woman with her hair in a bun, whereas a guy that could whip my ass, I'll say, yeah, I did it. The connections. God, that's weird. What's weird is, well, now I got to say weird in a street corner sense just among us revolutionists is what is weird is that nobody realizes that that ain't weird. What's weird is thinking it's weird to say yes or no. Yeah, but the consequences. No, 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 no. The circumstances. No, 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 no. Think of the possible connections if all the time you did just say, yeah, I did that. Uh, uh, boy, I could really cost you. No, you can talk as though it would. Yeah, I guess in some cases it could. It says a guy that looked roaring drunk and he was the size of you know, a linebacker and he said, who backed into my car? And you say, I did. You know, you might get punched out. So if you won't say that. But speak now about the normal run of events in life. It is not that kind of possible price you're going to pay that stops people from, as they put it, not me, as they put it, from simply telling the truth. Simply, plain speaking, yes, no. It is a cornucopia of qualifiers. Who backed into my car? Oh, is that your car? Uh, God, is that, is that a new scratch? Yeah, who did that? Were you here? Uh, you mean just now? We, did you hear anything? Somebody just backed into my car. Jesus, uh, I was in Kmart. Have you been in Kmart lately since they changed it? I don't know who backed into my car. Uh, don't you have insurance? Nothing wrong with all that little dialogue. But what is up that everyone college educated, sophisticated, on down to everyday man, believes that there is an extreme, either psychological, spiritual, God knows what, but there is some deep-rooted problem yet to be worked out about telling the truth, which is back to the religious context of simply saying yes or no. What is the damn big deal? What's up? Because I'm not going to stay here much longer, but you surely see put quite directly to say yes or no. And forget all these extreme cases where you might get punched out by telling the truth, as they put it. I just wanted to show you that even I can picture, regardless of all that, what is afoot to stop men, and further than that, to make men believe that there is a huge problem, of simply saying yes or no. Qualifiers, if you can see a little outside the ordinary limits, qualifiers actually operate. They are constructively synonymous with connections in the sense that unconnected ideas simply can't be allowed out in the secondary world in general. In fact, when unconnected ideas, they don't know what to make of it, but I already mentioned it last time we met, in a sense, unconnected ideas, even if they're heard by the general populace in the secondary world, they're taken as being, at the very least, non sequiturs, and at the extreme, the ravings of a madman. Quite expectedly and quite normally, to hear an idea expressed. And at first the idea, you know, the sentence, that is, which is the idea, makes a little, you know, it seems to move right along, nouns, verbs, and it's making a little sense, and then it seems to be that it came to a conclusion. The person, and it strikes you, without knowing my terms, without worrying about this way, that that is not connected. As far as you're concerned, the sentence was almost all right, and it got through, and it's unconnected. At the most innocuous end of the possibilities is what I meant by it's just taken as a non sequitur. The person might walk away, the listener, and forget it or think, well, the person uh, 
I'm, I must have misunderstood it. Or else they were having a joke, and I, I missed the joke. All the way from that, that if it had a wider audience, for some reason, the speaker, would, if he kept it up, would be judged to be insane. Even though the sentences by themselves make sense. Must say he even majored in English or English lit. And he can speak quite well. And you listen to sentences and you think, my, can't the man speak well? I mean, I mean, to be a maniac, but isn't his sentence structure neat and precise? I mean, it's as though he were speaking in diagrammed sentences. <laughs> yeah, but he is nuts. Oh, well, I know that, but I just thought I'd mention it about how well he speaks. <laughs> Whatever, and of course, for me talking about unconnected ideas, it is not that insanity verbally here on this level is in some way a benefit to anybody. But I'm having to stretch the re well, I'm having to stretch the reality again and point out that there are unrelated idea unconnected ideas, which is part of what all this talks about. But in the ordinary scheme of thing, out in the marketplace of the secondary world, it has no value and if it's not gonna happen, but if in some way it began to run rampant, it would be dangerous. It would be this unspecified out of dimension creature turned loose. That is, if unconnected ideas began to have an effect on ordinary intelligence, looked at from one view, if that did happen, which it can't, it would then be like that whole area, that this whole plant would go insane. It wouldn't be one person insane, then everybody would be insane because everyone would be thinking, their systems would be driven and being fed off of unconnected energy. And that can't be. That is not the secondary world. The secondary world is based on, fed by, supported by connections. The secondary world. You could say, as a matter of fact, that man's place, man's part of this particular universe, that, and we're talking about, of course, the secondary world of man, but that you could say that speech is the inaugural, speech is the sui genesis, the bow idol of connections. It is the father speech of connections. And we've mentioned it in other ways, but this is thrown throughout world mythology, religion, because I'll update it for you. After that first word, the rest of it is a piece of cake. All you got to do is have that first word, which throughout the myths and religions, you've always got these gods or some great force that wanders around, looks things over, and finally decides, ah, oh, what the hell, I'll give him a break. And so he gives him a word. Of course, this is not the way it's analyzed by mythologists and religiousists. But it's like the first word is given, and after that, hey, it's downhill. Because as long as you got one word, then it's like one tinker toy piece, and it begins to roll downhill. Not only does it not gather any moss, it begins to spew connections all you got to do is get that first word and that first word and you're in like a porch climber covered in lard there's nowhere to go but up or down or there's nowhere to go but there you are in the world of connections and it is self-fueling from all three-dimensional observations after the first word I wanted to use several questions, and we have received, off and on, inquiries that these tapes, they're getting made, get shown around at different places, and inquiries have come in several, more than several times, asking, apparently from interested parties to start with, but then saying, isn't there more to this than just talk? <laughs> isn't there more to this than just talk 
Now let's take what I'm trying to repeat, not as an attack, but as a kind of solicitation for, you know, more. You know, what, what's the rest of this? There's got to be more to this than just talk. Just talk. Well, excuse me. That was just a little cheap humor. Let me say, that some of you can hear, and maybe people that have ever thought that, if they ever hear this, might get something that you have, without a doubt, are still missing it if you don't understand that just this kind of talk is not just talk. I mean, not because of the innate wonderfulness of yours truly, but the just talk of this, when it has the right, you've got to have both partners. You can't just have one. That is, when you have the right performer and the right audience, to put it crudely, then this just talk is not just talk and you have missed it, you still don't get it if you don't begin to suspect that. Even people that just listen in, which is what I'm really responding to, and for inexplicable reasons, we'll assume. They just find themselves kind of attracted to this, and they listen, they want to hear more, but then they won't say, yeah, but isn't there more to this than just talk? I'm not going to feign stupidity of some kind because the world is full of pretend versions of this kind of stuff. Not of us, not of me, not of you, but of this kind of stuff. It is always, as life has the ordinary city running, and then it has what I have pictured as for you verbally as like a revolutionist camp somewhere outside the city. People that nervous systems that do not quite fit, not naturally, not just accidentally, they have driven themselves out there, not because they're antisocial, not for any known reason. But since I gotta say something, just to get a little fresh air and a little moving around room and to get some distance between them and everything going in the city, they're not mad. They just wonder if they're not something else and they gotta get away from it. And somewhere in between you've got, let's call them pretend people doing this. And it's not people, it's life. And all it is is like speed bumps. All it is is like the path between here and there. When I say you got pretend activities like this, it's not an attack on the people. It's like slower versions of this. It's like life saying, it's like life cutting down on drinking instead of just stopping. Did you understand that? No, I figured not. It's like part of life's body is over here and it's ordinary as it's supposed to be. And it's doing just what it's supposed to do. And then it's got these little parts like you do up here in case you don't think you've got anything in common in life besides your address. Because <laughs> life has all this ordinary stuff, and then life has these few unordinary stuff. Let's call it this kind of stuff over here. But instead of just being these two extremes, which is only, those kind of extremes only exist to Baptist ministers and some roofers west of the Mississippi. Other than that, there's always something in the middle. That's what I was calling to pretend this kind of stuff. Religions, cults, all kinds of stuff. When I said I was not going to myself engage in some sham form of non-sophistication that I don't really understand what somebody is asking about, isn't there more to this than talk? The basis throughout the history of man, this middle ground, this pablum form of this kind of stuff, is always involved with something very specific. In the religions, it's always, you know, join up and go through certain rituals. And then for those that are really involved with what I was inferring, the pretend version of this, they even believe that they're outside the city. Like, well, I've been in, I was born a Catholic, and then I studied mystical forms of Islam and Judaism, and they all got a little something and blah, blah, blah. But I, you know, the organized religions know what they're doing. And so they believe, you know, I'll track down some cult somewhere, some offshoot, there's some mystery still being hidden within all the great religions. And if they do find such a group, which they're, if they look hard enough, they'll find one or somebody will start one for them. <laughs> the group is not just talk. 
No, no, no. No. Never just talk. Everybody knows that, whether, whether you know you know or not. When you find a real pretend version of this, I always like people worrying about, how will I know if I ever get involved with a cult? Especially now, especially, especially now there's people saying, well, you know, there's cult specialists, which, you know, they got their own cults going, but no, don't, don't laugh because some of you, I know what will happen when it gets close to the weekend, it's dangerous. Instead of pet bulls, pit bulls, you'll let irony sneak up behind you and bite you on the ass. But anyway, cult specialists now say, wait a minute, it's getting so sophisticated that the thing is, don't be misled. Nobody, nobody goes out and says, well, I think I'll get taken in by a cult. No, no, no. No, it's too, it's too subtle. They don't appear to be a cult. You don't know they're a cult until it's too late. <laughs> well, I can cure all that. You know it's a cult because they immediately demand something. Well, mainly, give us everything you got. I mean, what else? Of course, they didn't ask me, did they? But all you got to do is they say, all right, give us everything you got. We're not a cult, but you give us everything. Something is demanded. There is something to do. And the easiest is, uh, give us all your money, sell everything you got, and give it to us. And of course, I'm being crude, but not that crude. There's always a little something like, so you found us. Yes, I did. <laughs> do you realize how dangerous life is? Yes, I do. Do you ever think maybe it's more dangerous than even you thought? Yeah. And of course, the dance is going on. I'm not inferring that the people running the cult know anything more than the one trying to join, but the dance gets faster and faster. The accordion player moves up closer to the dance floor. And he says, did you ever think that it may be more dangerous than anybody knows? And it's like, this person dancing is trying to find out how far can I dance with you? And the person says, yeah, at times I have. And it's like the cult suddenly gives you a dip and says, well, lucky for you that you found us because the end is coming soon. And only a few of us will survive. You go, oh, phew. He says, no, don't worry. I, I know it sounds bad, but at least you'll be one of the fortunate few because you found us. Now go, since it won't make it any difference anyway, go get all your money out of the bank. Sell everything you got and bring me the money so we can all band together and survive this. And they ask, isn't there more to this than talk? Just talk. Because if it wasn't that, that was the crude part, after that, then they've got to keep doing something. Like, well, from now on, we're all going to quit eating vegetables on Tuesday. We'll all shave off half of our hair. We'll all kneel down to a picture of somebody at 3 o'clock every afternoon. There's always something. And of course, I can say, you know, kneel down to a photograph of somebody or shave off half your hair, and people, even ordinary people, go, ha, ha, ha. And of course, they don't go, ha, 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 if they're Catholic, and I say somebody, <laughs> well, we go, and we light a bunch of candles. You go in this little dark booth, and you ask for sexual advice from a man that never had any. Well, quite simply, there's nowhere else that, no, we're not kicking anybody around. It's quite simply that all of life is primed and wired up, that then, like itself, believes that to do something, you have to do something. That is, and even if you get into the world of information, into the world of this, ordinary people are not satisfied. They're not supposed to be. They can say, well, wait, some of this really sounds intriguing. God, in fact, I'm getting hooked on this, but... And what they're saying when they said, isn't there more than just talk? You know what they're asking? They're saying, tell me something to do. And they don't mean tell me something to think. They say, tell me something to do. And what they're wanting is even after they're interested in such as this, here, then they want, all right, should I start lighting candles that are twice as tall as we used to in the church? Tell me something to do. This is no attack on anybody. This is the nature of the wiring system of man. I just wanted you to hear because all of you have been through this. Some of you are still slashing through it. That life, the way it's wired up in the city, for things to apparently change, there has to be something material. For people to say, well, tell me what to do, they mean, by God, something to physically do. Not just talk. I mean, as amazing as some of that is. 
I want to know what to do. Oh, all right, shave off half your hair. Ah, I don't understand it, but the, the, re the rest of that information, uh -uh. I'm not going, no, I'm not going to stop now. I'll try it. You do hear me, don't you? They would feel for the time being, the kind of people would be interested, they would feel, uh-huh, especially with just a little mumbo jumbo. Such, such as not putting it on a tape is like responding back to people or saying, well, now, don't let this out. Don't tell anybody else. But shave off half your hair, and then we'll, we'll progress with this. I'll tell you more later. People would do it. But don't laugh at them. People would do it. The, wor the wiring system is such that it is actually a cry. It's somewhere between a cry for more help and, as I said, I didn't take it. I wasn't responding the way. But all the way from that to an attack of saying, well, this all sounds great, but you know, isn't there more to it than just talk? They're also asking without knowing it, not just for something physically, materially to do, but they're also ahead in the thinking that is the connection that if this is intriguing as it seems to tingle me at times, as it sounds, then whatever their payoff is, they may not put it this way by any means, but if I question them at all, the payoff to them in some way is going to be physical. That is, I, I will all right, maybe live after I die. Maybe I won't die. Maybe I will grow a third eye. Maybe I'll grow a third ear. <laughs> they may not be able, they may not have ever put it in words. But if questioned, their nervous system would hear, it would respond to what I was asking, and it would believe in some way, even if it said, I'm not sure what. But it is sure that the payoff has got to be something other than just talk. But what is there besides just talk? Do you still believe, I ask rhetorically, do any of you still believe that you're going to grow a third eye? Do you believe that you're going to be able to live without sleep? Do you believe that you're going to be able to live without food? Do you believe that you're going to be able to live outside in the rain and the lightning and the variations in the temperature from all extremes and not have any effect on you? Do you still believe that? Or if it was true, are you, you know, would you still work for that? Would you still go through some process? And so the question of, is there something more to this than just talk? Anyone who may have asked that and anyone who may have thought it, don't take it as being a backhanded dismissal of it. But you still don't quite have it to believe that that is a valid question. You don't quite have it to believe in some way without you examining it of what the alternative would be. Put lastly, you don't understand what you are saying when you say, just talk. <laughs> Specifically, unconnected with all of it, was a couple of inquiries. <laughs> and in part, the heart of it, one of them goes like this. What is the nature of expectations with humans? And why does expectation, why are expectations apparently so deep-rooted, so much an integral part of human nature? Uh, first off, consider the world of man, the secondary, ordinary world of man, the world of the intellect, could not exist, could no longer function were it not for expectations. You can see expectations as being a kind of unanalyzed, assurance that the nervous system feels that some sort of new or some sort of altered connections are upcoming. That some sort of variety <laughs> is upcoming. <laughs> because expectations, the way it's normally used, is a positive. You don't say, uh, boy, what are your expectations in life? Well, let's see. Uh, I plan to die, and before I, <laughs> and before I do, uh, I'm going to be sick a lot and maybe have, oh, as much surgery as I can afford. You know, expectations. 
at least in the connotation, the use of, kind of expectations, is it's for something positive to the expectator. But what is that? Now, they could say, well, new experiences and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's not new. It is an assurance that the nervous system already has that expectations, what it actually represents, is the assurance that there's going to be a variety, or at least a shift, an alteration in the connections. Because there is nothing new. Go back and check your high school physics book. Yeah, but you've never seen fashions like this falls fashions that are coming out of Milan. You got, ah, that's the whole point of fashion. That's the whole point of fads. What can you do new about putting something around you to stay warm when it's cold or to take it off when it's hot? Uh, we'll move the belt line. <laughs> we'll lower the hemline. We'll widen the lapels on men's suits. But it's not new. That's not the point. It's not an attack on fashion. But it is the assurance in the secondary world, which is a safe assurance. It's built in. It's not psychological. It's a safe assurance. That's what expectations are of upcoming variety, as it seems. So to ask why are expectations so much a part of human nature, than that which actually constitutes human nature, not the primary intelligence, not the primary world of man, but that which actually constitutes the singular, unique part that would be defined as human nature would not exist without expectations. But if you could take away the energy behind the word expectation, that is the reality, and you took away expectations, you would have the final act or new version of Ibsen's Wild Duck. You know, if you took away a man's expectations, it's no big deal. You've killed him. An ordinary man. Your nervous system. I say ordinary man forgets somebody somewhere with a psychological profile that's different from yours. The human nervous system at this end is dead if you took away what is known as expectations. Well, they even, you know, people understand that. Or life lets people understand that. That what is the supreme, what is the supreme punishment, torture, this side of death? It's isolate somebody. Not just from humans, which is bad enough with ordinary people, but from as much of input, from as much energy, that is, put them in a three by five cell, just enough, you know, put them in a closet like this, no windows, no nothing, and just give them enough food, just some gruel, to say, keep them alive, don't let them die. I mean, that's somebody that really <coughs> rubbed the king the wrong way. That is the ultimate punishment. They have cut out all expectations. I mean, operationally you have, but of course it would help some in the beginning for a few days. The king really wants to you know, rub it in is to say, all right, get in there for a second. So you get in there, and there you are. And then maybe they got one little flap so they can put in your gruel, and the king says, maybe he leaves you in there an hour or so, just till you begin to get a feel of it. So he opens up the flap, and he says, how do you like that, Bunky? And of course you don't like it much. And he says, oh, by the way, I have decided after reviewing your case carefully... He said, I've decided you will stay in there for 87 years. Bye. <laughs> now, he has taken away all expectation. As long as you can remember, in a few days you're going to be kind of ordinarily nuts, and you may not even remember. But at least for the few days he got in a little bit more because he has taken away up here the expectations. Of course, once this begins to go in the ordinary sense and you're just there, he has taken away the expectations you have, even at the primary level, other than food. Because there you stand and there is no variety of energy that's even formidable at the primary level or getting through to you. You're living on a minimal amount, just the absolute minimal amount of energy input, even at the primary level. The secondary level, you have been constructively murdered. They know that. I mean, humans have learned that. Well, they say you just go mad. You just go nuts, and if they ever did let the guy out, nobody would recognize him. He probably couldn't talk. You know, I don't give you the blues, but you can imagine what it would be to be in there for years. You come out, and you're not even human anymore. That's probably what they'd say. Well, Jesus. You know, if they overthrow the king, and they go through and they let out people like that, what are they going to be like after a few years? About all you can say is, you know, somebody <laughs> take care of them because, you know, they're almost not human anymore. Exactly. Exactly. We can describe it several ways, but one of them is you have extracted from their nervous system 
the ability to eat, to receive the kind of energy that comes out verbally called expectations. So to ask, uh, which was a good question, is why I even used it, but to ask, why is it so deep rooted in human nature in a sense, is always operationally, once you begin to understand what I've tried to say about synonyms, operationally, human nature is expectations, amongst other things. It's not just tied to it. You take away expectations and you have, as they say in the wonderful world of the law, you have constructively taken away human nature. The other one was, a uh, person was asking, my quick version of it, uh, what is it behind people's belief that others do not understand me or else they would not treat me as mistreat me, but they would not treat me as they do? What is the kind of energy? I'm putting my own twist on this so we can respond to it in a certain way. But what is the reality, what is the energy behind ordinary man's beliefs that other people, you know, specific people of course, but other people don't understand me really or else you know, they couldn't treat me like this. What's up? Okay, got it. Next question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> totally unconnected to what we're talking about let's look at it this way this belief is actually this that ordinary normal basic expectations have in some way failed because don't get home because this is so simple you never think about it but to say how could somebody mistreat me how could somebody I know not understand me enough to do what they did. Whether you think that they did it totally in a willful manner, whether they did it through some sort of disinterest in you. What you're saying though about how could somebody mistreat me if they actually understood me? How can this happen? What you are saying, the energy behind it, you are saying that the normal expectations, the normal connections between me and this person and some anomalous manner, these expectations are broken down. And it's not psychological. That's the way it comes out now. People can try and debate it or argue, how could you do me this way? But you, you do see that this is totally unconnected to the first question I read. That the expectations that are normal <coughs> under all normal conditions the civilized expectations amongst all civilized people in some aberrant manner have just failed. It's like I plugged in the lamp and it suddenly burned my toast. <laughs> or I plugged in the lamp and it spewed water in my face. The inference being that life arranges with ordinary people in that camp. That however I am wired up and primed to feel the flows, the ebbs and flows, the proper flows of life, <coughs> anytime things do not agree with me, anytime that my expectations, which are normal, basic, routine, civilized, that my expectations are not fulfilled there's some strange creature loose. <laughs> and it comes out on the basis of, well, they simply don't understand me, not, not at least anybody who is otherwise civil, especially somebody who knows me personally, maybe Ken or a good friend. Something is obviously dangerously askew 
Because they would not ordinarily do this. Now forget the people. You're saying that the energy flow has failed. You're saying that the very connections that seem to be the civilized, secondary world of man, the expectations, which are well founded in the city, have gone awry. But notice, half of the expectations in the city, let's say just real roughly, that half of them, half the time, are going awry. With the luckiest of people. <laughs> That any time if you jump down on planet Earth in the ordinary count, but just ordinary people, and you froze everything, and you could sit and look at everybody, or you could question them, and say, right now, whatever dance you're involved with, whether it was through a telephone, fax machine, daydreaming, talking to somebody, hugging someone, fighting someone, you, there was some expectation about what was going on between you and this other person, between you and that institution, or between you and life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it being met? Did you feel like that uh, your expectations, that they actually understood what you wanted and they were treating you in a decent manner? Half the people say yes and half the people say no. Then crank things back up and let it run, what, another 30 seconds and stop it? And chances are, of course, I'm being crude, but it's not unfounded, that those who thought, who said yes 30 seconds before would now say no. So what's new? That is the nature of living in a polarized world. That is the nature of the ordinary nervous system. And that is the total area that I wanted to show you is not connected at all between expectations and the question of how could anyone treat me this way who knew me at all? Notice that the human nervous system never asks itself not in any meaningful way. I don't mean that they didn't accidentally say it sometimes. Nobody ever asked themselves, how can I treat me this way? <laughs> if they do, now I know people say things like that, but then they go, well, wait a minute, the connections of this. Uh, you're right, sometimes uh, you know, I shouldn't be drinking as much as I do. I don't know what it is, my father, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the economy, you don't know what's happening in my business. I, I know I shouldn't. I do things that are probably not in my best interest specifically health-wise. That's about all people can talk about physically. I probably shouldn't do that, but the connections of it. But then, you're back to, if you can see this, the kind of question about, what's the big deal about telling the truth? Well, just tell the truth. What's the big deal of people saying, well, you're right. Uh, knowing me as I do, I, I can't understand why I treat me like I do. What kind of fucking big deal is that? Pardon me. If you know you, why would anybody mistreat themselves? Now, I'm not talking about ordinary people, because we all know. If we go back to ordinary level, why we do that? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> but, but it's connected to something. I just don't have time. We, we know it's connected to something. We just don't understand what. But if you're not going to be ordinary, what is the big deal to say, well, how can I mistreat me like I do? How come I do me like I do, do, do? <laughs> of course, I'm suggesting new intelligence, once it begins to see such questions, does not have to go off and ponder, go get sit in a cave, it has an immediate answer to it. How can I do me this way? I can't. 